Good morning, evening, friends. Oh. I'm your friendly announcer. And I got some serious news to pass on to everybody. Because what I'm about to say could mean the world's disaster. And that's what it has done. Good morning, y'all. Good afternoon. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the Mental House with me, your host, Khadija. I'm glad to be back. Had a little mini vacation. Always good to get a break, okay, and recharge your batteries. But what I want to talk about today is, you know, I'm I, I, I'm not going to talk too much. I'm going to allow the video to speak for itself. However, I want to admonish um, black folk. Yeah. Because I really, um, the more I, the older I get, the more I see how damaged we are from slavery. Oh, yeah, we damaged. We so damn damaged that we don't even know it. We so damn damaged that it's pathetic. And I'm going to bring it right back to Fonny. Because a lot of y'all made fun and had fun with her. Um, I tried to stay neutral. I, t I said before she should let uh, Nathan Wade go, which she eventually was forced to do. But what I was surprised at and what, was, what hurt me so much is that we had so much to say about Fonny and her um, situation. And I'm not going to totally exempt myself, but I wasn't as wicked as a lot of y'all. Because I, I, I kept bearing in mind that the girl is human. And, and, and I think my, one of my later videos was like, and I don't know if, if this is really a conflict of interest. It's not like... She had sex with the judge or somebody from the uh, defense side. So I, I, I started to shut my mouth and listen. But what got me is the I started seeing the black hatred. All the content creators that was coming out on us and talking about all black women are city girl, or district attorney, city girls, lawyers, and because we don't assimilate and act just like white folk. Because Fanny came in there with, uh, I even heard Judge Joe Brown talking about Fanny with her hand on her hip. Dude, you so damn, uh, uh, okay. I'm not going to say anything other than a lot of older black people, baby boomers <laughs> and beyond, were really forced to do things a certain way so they don't even see their madness they don't even see um how the europeans got his mark all over his mouth so when when i start thinking about Fani, and i start saying damn we worry more about her than we are about trump okay have we forgotten that he's an insurrectionist? Huh? Have we forgot that he's a tax frauder, a racist? Took campaign funds to pay a porn star. Grabs women's by the pussies. <laughs> I mean, since when was Mar-a-Lago a damn graveyard? But that's neither here nor there. A grapist. Y'all know what I mean when I say grapist. But yet and still, we want to throw Fonny under the bus and let her burn because she had sex with Nathan Wade. And she, she it, uh, uh, knowing the history of these people, how they all so salacious and want to hear about our sex life and how we do things. And they was all probably sitting back there getting off. But we joined the bandwagon. People like O'Shea Du Jackson and uh, the rest of y'all who made it seem like she was a city girl mayor. I, I really feel bad 
I, I feel s sick for who we are as a group of people who have been turned upside down, inside out, shaken any way other than loose, and how we are a fight our own for the for this government who sanctioned the war against us. You ever notice that everybody that's black always <clears throat> got money issues? And I'm not saying, uh, uh, you know, we d there's a few of us that don't. But everybody is not like uh, Tiffany Henyard. And for us to buy into that narrative as black people who've been the victims of Sanction abuse, we do that to our own. So I'm glad Fonnie was given the opportunity to stay on the case. Now a lot of y'all thinking about, well, why should she stay on the case? Why should she? Look at Donald Trump's list. And look at her. And she had the balls, the balls to bring him to the light. To indict him. She got balls. She wear them on her chest. And most of you wimpy ass. Negroes. Y'all really got. Um, okay. I'm, I'm not even going to go there. I will say this. After I was listening to this. Uh, this merchant chick. And I'm going to let. <clears throat> the 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 brother because see everybody else jumped on the bandwagon but the brother Jones he kept his composure and he broke down everything that y'all didn't want to see jumping on the white girl's bandwagon to hang Fonny and Nathan so let's just listen to this for a minute and then See if y'all can feel what I'm talking about. Um, but yeah, so they're highly regulated, and we know these were deposited in his title search because the back of the checks for Fulton County show where they were deposited. And have you asked him about this? Has he given any explanation for why he put the, ran this money through a trust account? Oh, before I go on, let her go on. When she came into this Senate uh, hearing, Oh, she came in like she was just the special, special witness. And there's about eight, seven or eight white guys around to about three uh, black people. And they came in. She came in, prancing, and they all impressed with her because she acted as if she was going to hang the Negroes. And this is what a lot of y'all liked. But there was a brother that wasn't impressed. And he asked all the questions that needed to be asked. Is it still in there? We don't. I, I mean, the last I knew, he is, he didn't give any explanation. I mean, he just said that that he pays for everything through his business, and then he basically just said his accountant figures it all out. Okay. I know you have a court appearance this <laughs> afternoon, and you've been very patient with us. Um, I'm going to give uh, Senator Harold Jones an opportunity to ask a few questions. With under our rules, uh, we do allow at least one member of the minority party to participate. And Senator Jones, you're not time limited. Uh, you, you, if, if you, when the buzzer hits and you've got to go to court, okay. you tell us, but I feel like we got at least 15, 20 oh, minutes. Oh, definitely do. And I'm happy to answer any questions you have. Um, my court's at 115 in Fulton County, so, you know, okay. if I get in trouble, if you can call the judge, then I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> you got it. I just wanted to go back to the issue about the conflict. I think that's kind of what brought us all here to some extent. On one issue, on, in your brief, the most recent one that you filed. The, the second one? <clears throat> right. Okay. On page 21 of that, you went ahead <clears throat> and acknowledged that the aspect about him not signing, I believe, or being duly authorized to be a prosecutor, that that's already been handled in one, in one court, but you're still bringing that issue back up. But it has been decided in the negative. In one court, of course, you are still bringing that issue back up. Yeah, so you're talking about the oath? Right. The oath issue. Yeah, so, so Manny Aurora was working on this issue early on, and he filed a motion about the oath, 
at the time, it hadn't been filed. And in and of itself, that's not, you know, that's it, not filing an oath. That's not going to get rid of a case. That's not going to disqualify in and of itself. Clearly, the judge told us that. Right. Her. But to, I was trying to paint the entire picture and how I felt that it was relevant. You know, and it, it definitely is not a ground that I was arguing for disqualification. But I felt that it was relevant because it shows that they were hiding this relationship. And all the evidence indicates that. Right. Now I was just going to. So I'm uh, moving on to this next particular point oh, yeah. here, which goes to uh, page 24 of your brief, which deals with, I think, the thing that's really out there in the media, which deals with the relationship and, and aspects of that, that in some kind of way this creates a conflict of interest. And, of course, the judge is going to rule on that, but I still think it's important to kind of go through it. Um, and you cite the case of Woodward versus State. What in that case actually applies to this particular case? Last one that I filed? Yeah. On, so February 9th. Yes, page 24. Page 24. You said Woodward? Uh, Withward. I don't see Withward. At the bottom, Georgia court said to develop their own standard for disqualification of prosecutors. That's not my page 24. You must be looking at a different. Um, the one that was filed February 9th at 347. And one thing I got to note before I go on, because I don't want the video to be too long is this woman was the most arrogant, smuggest white woman that was just, to me, she was way too much. And she acted like she was doing cocaine. If I had to give her this thing, I would think that she was a, a cocaine user. Okay, now, I ain't say she was. All I'm saying is. Can't hear you. I'm so sorry. Just I'm so sorry. Yes, I want to make sure I'm following the same one. Um, you're talking about the defendant's supplemental reply that was filed on February 9th at 347? No, let's go back. Okay. Let's use your first one. Okay. 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 Yeah. All the white men staring at One is a little bit more. Okay. So that one there on the Whitworth case, okay. tell me how that actually impacts this particular case. Which page are you referring to? Page 24. Page 24. With it. Um, so the site is Whitworth. The court recognized a conflict of interest as a ground for disqualification. Um, it held to arise where the prosecutor had acquired a personal interest or stake in the defendant's conviction. Um, and I, I don't, you know, I, I wish I had that case in front of me. I don't have the case in front of me. But essentially, to answer your question, the that first of all is f physical precedent only. So right. yes, and we. we but you did cite it. And and says right. that it's physical yeah. precedent only. And you're using that as the basis, really, to say it's a conflict. There's no other case law that you actually use in this particular brief to say it's a conflict other than Whitworth and also amusement sales, which deals with contingency fee. Right. And so in Whitworth, um, and I have the case if you want to go through it, it actually talks about that there's ways of citing the conflict. Right. Number one would be if he had or the prosecutor had actually spoken to the defendant. Had that, has that taken place? No. Okay, second, has he represented the Check defendant? it out, y'all. No, he hasn't. There was a motion early on. Uh -huh. um, <laughs> it was. I didn't even bring this up here, and I don't think we talked about it in the brief, but there was a motion early on because Mr. Campbell, who's Mr. Wade's law partner, actually sent a mailer out to okay. my client and all, all of the uh -huh. defendants. Yeah. yeah, so I don't think anybody called based on that, but they did advertise to them uh -huh. saying, call us to represent you. And then they came with the third, which says there has to be a personal stake in the defendant's conviction. Right. So is that what you're relying on there, that there's a personal stake in his conviction? No, in the prosecution also. So and in that case, that's, again, that's physical precedent only. And I don't remember the specific facts of that case. I know case, you don't. But, um, but you cited it's not just a conviction. And obviously the state, the state wants it to be just a conviction. Um, and we argued this extensively over three hours, I think, um, in front of the court. But... It's also a personal stake in the prosecution, and that was an amusement, you know, prosecution. In that case, they, they, that was a contingency fee case. So That's that was correct. completely different. Yeah. And so an amusement, it was a contingency fee case. So they had a personal stake actually really in the conviction right. because they only received the contingency fee when the conviction happened. Right. So what you're really saying is that they had a personal stake in just bringing the case. 
because he can't have a, there's no personal stake in the conviction similar to amusement, correct? Well, so amusement's a little bit different because there is no conviction in a forfeiture. Correct, but they're going to get money if they win. Right, right, but there's no conviction. You but they're going to get money if they win. That's the key. They get money if they keep the forfeiture, so it's where, it, that was a forfeiture case. I think that was like game slot. That's correct. Yes. But they get money if they win. Right. But That's you're the only way right. they get money. Yes. But they don't get money for conviction. bringing it. So I just wanted to make sure it was clear right. that that was not conviction because it, you can't have a conviction. But they only get money if they're the victor. In He's receiving his funds. Mr. Wade's receiving his funds because he's dealing because the case is going on, correct? Oh, yeah. Not because he wins a case. No, he can lose the case and still have a... Absolutely. Have a, make a ton of money off of it. So what you're saying is the actual conflict is just bringing it. No, the actual conflict is... Oh, God, it's that's a long answer. Um, the actual conflict is lying on your disclosures about how much money... I'm talking as far as there. this issue is concerned right here. When you use with worth, you use amusement sales... And they say that there has to be an actual conflict and amusement sales. And let's go back to Whitworth if we can, because in Whitworth, the person was actually told, the prosecutor was actually told by another prosecutor that they want the case to actually resolve in a conviction. Because what had happened was the defense attorney came to the prosecutor and said, we would like to plea. Mm -hmm. And the prosecutor basically said, no, he went and got advice from somebody. And that prosecutor said, we would like this case to resolve in a conviction. Right. And so the question, and that then was held not to be a conflict. They said that still is not an actual conflict, even though someone told that prosecutor, we want to see a conviction. We actually want to see it go to the end. Don't plea them out. And the court said, no, that's not an actual conflict, because what you have to show is there's an actual unfairness to the defendant in the trial. Can you point to any unfairness no. in the trial that's taking place? It's, n it's not in the trial, so it's not limited just to the trial. But to answer the first part of your question, when you were asking about the conviction of her, she thinks she's smart. Um, Ms. Willis has made numerous public statements about her interest in a conviction, and they love her. Black people and white people, they think this broad is really on top of her game. Okay, she just fast because, like I said, she's suspect. Okay, I done been around a lot of them. And she one of them. Nope. Allegedly. But let me tell you something. For all you black folk again, who think it's your duty, a duty to take the story from white people, the way they see it, the way they tell it, the way, and that's when it's verified and, or verifiable. When we do it different because we are different, okay, and when they can get you to forget all about these things I just said about Donald Trump. And yet still you want to focus on Fonnie because she might have spent uh, a $2. Or, and oh, she kept saying, uh oh, well, the statue is $100. Any damn body know that that's not worth you talking about a conflict of interest. She had personal vendetta, a personal reason. And for black people to really, really, really jump on Fonnie's, matter of fact, we were worse to her than white folk was. And I didn't even listen to uh, black content creators when it came to this. You know who I listened to? I listened to the white lawyers. Now, this is a shame because, unfortunately, everything in America is black and white. The thing, though, is you got to find the right righteous white people. Okay, because everything is black and white, and most of the uh, black people will be glad to do like Tyreek said, get some uh, butter biscuits. Okay, and they'll jump on her bandwagon, jump on the uh, pro uh, this, uh, prosecution against this African American woman, this black woman, and treat her like she Tiffany. Henyard, because she had a relationship with a black man. What would y'all would have did if it was with a white man? See, we are really messed up. We really messed up. But I'm going to go ahead and let her finish. And let her finish being examined by the bruh. Um, there's some emails that had been admitted as part of it, um, as part of some of the exhibits in the case. There's a lot of pleadings, so I don't know which one exactly but talking about her, her desire for there to be a conviction and jail time. And then in my case, for example, um, 
So Mr. Wade offered my client misdemeanor probation. So we were the first people to get an offer. And we said no, we wanted a dismissal because he was not guilty. And that did not happen. So obviously there's an interest in him being convicted of something because when the plea offer was for him to pay a $5,000 fine and have a misdemeanor. So in reality, because you said that you want to extend the case out, right. he was actually trying to end your client's case. With a $5,000. It was going to end. There was no more, it was no more billing on that case because earlier you Just said, fine. but earlier you said that you believe, which was total speculation, that they created this case against your client to do more billing. And what you're just telling me now is that he was willing to stop his billing because he offered your client a misdemeanor and you rejected it. You're the one who's continuing to bill him. Oh, I don't bill by the hour. No, no, you're the one that's continuing to make him bill. He was willing to cut that off. You said, I believe that they created this case against my client right. so they can continue to bill. Not well, he basically client. went out and said, I'm tired of billing. I'm going to offer misdemeanors. Okay, and you said no. Take a couple notes because you had a couple questions in there. I want to make sure I answer all of them. Um, so the billing, so as far as the billing and the offer, so what I was trying to explain, and I'm glad you gave me this opportunity to, to sort of go into it in a little more detail. Um, I tried to explain that there are really three classifications of how I broke the indictment down. There's the folks that are involved at the federal level. You see those people having, um, you know, they, they were in D.C. Then you see the electors. Then you see cost. These cases could have been handled. Mark, we, we can't even hear you. Oh, I'm so here. sorry. Just pull it I didn't, up right sorry. to you. P pull it to the edge of the desk if you have to so everybody okay. can hear. Sorry. Okay. So how I was trying to explain it is I separate this down into three different types of cases. Um, and it could have been handled that way. Coffee County could have been prosecuted in Coffee County if it had been chosen to do that. Um, the stuff with the federal could have been handled in federal court if they had chosen to do that. Then the electors would have been the only remaining case that could have been prosecuted in Fulton County. Instead of choosing to do that, and it's not just my client in particular, but that group, that group in the middle, by putting them all three together, it expands the litigation. How it expands it is a couple different ways. Um, it expands it because when you charge a RICO case, you can bring in evidence of everything. So essentially, instead of having a case, a, a, a quick case, you know, a case where there's evidence against Michael Roman, only Michael Roman, you litigate that. They expanded it to include these three different classifications. What does that do? That means the trial's gonna be a year. They can plead people out, you know, they can plead Michael Roman out, they can plead this person out, they can plead people out, but it, they're always going to have that large enterprise. And it actually does, even if they pled my client out, the offer was for him to testify. So, you know, for him to testify, even though he would not be on trial, his acts would still allegedly be on trial, which still expands the litigation because he's not gone. The deal's not, you can plead out and you're gone, bye. We're not taking up time with you. It still expands it. So it still, so my whole point earlier was that this expands the litigation. Because imagine if we just had, like you see in, in other cases, one defendant. You can limit the information to just that crime and that case. Or you could have three separate indictments. But what we've done here is we've put them all together. You've made it so that it's necessary to try them, have three trials. Because there's no courtroom that can fit all of those people. So it just, that expands the litigation. So in a case, in the case that you cited, mm -hmm. physical or not, Whitworth. Whitworth. Same thing in the YSL case, right? Okay. Just check it. It says specifically that when the prosecutor goes up, Morgan, who is the person who's not supposed to, who's talking to him, who's the prosecutor, Hobbs informs Morgan, who's the prosecutor, that he anticipated a successful criminal prosecution but that any decision regarding Whitworth's proposal to Morgan was Morgan's to make. Morgan decided to continue to go forward. And they said that that was not a conflict, that that was his dis prosecutor's decision to make. And you're saying, using this is the case you cite, well, in, our ca in your case, they actually came to you and said, we're willing to give you a plea. And you said no, which is perfectly fine. But then you say, well, they want to extend prosecution on my client. They were willing to cut it off. And so therefore, the case that you cite is totally opposite than what the situation that you're dealing with. How would you say that you have a conflict in this case? Based on this case, just saying just based on this case, that was your first case that you cited in your brief. I, I don't think it was actually the first case, but I- The first was actually a federal case, but the first Georgia case you cited was Whitworth on this particular issue. 
Correct. And again, I, you know, I don't have Whitworth in front of me, and there's a lot of different facts about these cases. I would be happy to review it. And he like, didn't already say it. He had it. Is that I still, and, and we still believe that this is to expand the litigation. So you've got those. You've got this concerted effort, which we have seen, unfortunately, drag out over the last couple months, this concerted effort to hide this information from the public, to keep this information out. I think that it is very reasonable for a court to think that that is a conflict of interest. And whether or not it's a stake in the conviction, a stake in the prosecution, we definitely have seen a stake in the prosecution. Um, and, you know, Whitworth, the problem with Whitworth, and this is... Who, who actually brings the case? The district attorney. Well, uh-huh. in this... <laughs> How do we get the case? Well, we know a lot more now because of the book, Find Me the Votes. Um, so we, we know a lot more than we normally would know. So, and that's one of the things that we talk about in my motion. In this case, it was actually Mason Ray. So he's the one that he presented most of the witnesses. Presented How was your client case. charged? How were these clients charged? Oh, so my client was charged just in the actual grand jury. Okay. Yeah. So a grand jury. Yes. Okay. So we had a special grand jury. And then we had a grand jury. Who made this determination? Well, it, yes. They made the determination to bring charges, basically. Um, to indict, correct? Yes, and I... And I so is, are they part of all of this? No, 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 no. But um, I, I've never had the privilege of being inside of a grand jury, but I have heard a lot about what happens inside of a grand jury. It is a witness who comes, and in this case, it was actually the investigator for the DA's office. So just understand this. It is a very low standard of proof. It's probable cause. Um, I have had clients who were dead indicted. I actually had a lawyer that I worked with at the public defender that was indicted along with his client because the DA presented an indictment that actually had the lawyer's name on it by accident. So and the grand jury indicted him. So you're saying the grand jury has flaws? 100%. Oh. So would you, would you think it would be better for just the uh, prosecutor to draw the accusations? No. no. So the grand I, jury... I know you guys have a bill doing that right now. Um, you know, no, I definitely don't think so. The grand jury is better than, than no oversight. Correct. Definitely. But right. it's, a, it's a continuum. So my point in bringing that up is the grand jury is not perfect. The grand jury is, I'm not allowed to be part of the grand jury. It is not what I would call adversarial. So the grand jury is one-sided. They only hear from the prosecutor. So, and they hear hearsay. So in this case, using it as an example, the investigator for the DA's office listened to all the January 6th testimony, read all the testimony, went in there and summed it up for the grand jury. They present, the, the grand jury doesn't draw up the indictment. They actually, the prosecutor brings that indictment, and then they vote, and it's a majority. So all they have to do is a majority vote, and it's by a very low standard. It's a probable cause, which is about 25% proof. So you've got hearsay. You've got a witness who hasn't actually witnessed anything personally. You've got a standard of 25%. Um, I think there should be much more safeguards on the grand jury process, personally, but that's for another day. So you went through the special grand jury, and they made their recommendations. Then went to a grand jury, and they, of course, made their recommendations. And how many persons have actually pled in this particular case? Uh, two or three. Two or three already. And they were lawyer. Well, there was one. So the so so the first. So now she's trying, trying to minimize everything. He was not because of the the state law for bond bonding agents. He's not able to actually run his business while he's on bond. So he had a significant financial interest in entering a plea early on because he was essentially couldn't work if he didn't enter a plea. And I mean, he got probation. You know, it was not exact. Not what you would imagine in a in a huge racketeering case. You would not imagine probation. In a other two people who pled are both lawyers, um, lawyers at the end of their career, and you know, you. Uh, I can imagine when I'm close to retirement and I have my retirement funds, if I would want to spend them there she on go. a criminal trial, like a narcissist, children, I would pick, spend them instead of going on about some other shit. Talking about is Mr. Way's current qualifications. So, yeah. um, but you did mention early on that he was very interest, uh, instrumental in the special grand jury process. So he's been there. He's been part of this process. Right. So other than just his bill, you said that you recognize that he's been part of the process. So even though he's very, I guess, what everyone's saying is inexperienced, he was able to go to a special grand jury and get their rec- positive recommendations, I guess, from the from state side. He's able to go to a grand jury and, and, and get indictments, which now on the state side. And since y'all trying to minimize plead guilty, Nathan Wade. So this inexperienced former assistant solicitor, I mean, he's not doing too bad, is he? I mean, if you want to talk about his qualifications and whether I think he's qualified, I'm happy to talk about No, that. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. I mean, when you say that someone's totally unqualified, that's basically what's been going on. It's very surprising that he's able to go to a special grand jury. You say he's integral well, in that. 
Yeah. And after us going to a grand jury and say Vince McMahon is that, that then, then why do you say that he done cheated? And he didn't do it to plead guilty. And, but, but basically he's saying those are just lawyers that don't want to do anything anymore and they just let their clients get away. Yeah. I understand. No, no. So, so. You see there? I'm not going to go no further, y'all, but I just want you to know what it sounds like when a black man that is comfortable speaking truth to power, not like a lot of these assimilators that we see, they'll stand up and they'll challenge, they'll challenge the lily white woman who call herself the savior of the defense team. And he will put her feet to the fire like none of us was willing to do. None of us was willing to defend her like that. Not just because we were not lawyers, but because a lot of us were quick to condemn her all the way. And say she needed to be removed from her seat. So y'all means y'all comfortable with white folk still being in all these positions of authority like important positions like district attorneys okay that's why it's such a travesty in my opinion about what's going on with Marilyn Mosby okay and what they're trying to put her in jail for 40 years for see y'all just don't understand maybe because it didn't happen to y'all before where you had to go to jail um, on some dumb shit and in mine, Alberto Gonzalez prosecuting me. He he was the attorney general at that time. And going to jail because they said I'm a vote thief. Uh-huh. See, y'all don't know what that feels like. And then again, your own people turn against you faster than anybody else. That's all I got to say about it. And that's the stuff I'm saying we got to stop. That's why I have very little trust in black folk. I do. They got to be vetted really, really well because they like to slave on Django, the two slaves that were made to fight. And they'll fight to the blood come out. One of them representing the... Uh, DiCaprio and one of them represent, repping himself and they pit us against each other and they ain't never stopped so I wonder what y'all think about that and I know this was extremely long but I just had to get that out this been bothering me Ashley Merchant and cause we all know now what the result was and I want to give a shout out to that brother who don't want to simulate like most black men do. I'll see y'all in the next video. Thank you for listening. And if you like what you hear, please like, please share my world.